on today's episode of Shade to Sun, the long-awaited episode where I explain in terms of physics and biology the law of attraction and how a thought becomes a thing. Sounds of your freedom Don't change like the seasons When Satan turns to sun When tears become one You follow your dreams Okay, first, um, I want to thank a good friend of mine uh, on Facebook who's across the sea, as it were, uh, across the pond, as they say. And she uh, and I had a discussion, and it uh, was about psychic ability and some other things. And what kind of came of it was, you know, the, the fact that there's uh, a lot of charlatans out there. And there are a lot of people who, um, who uh, really don't respect it and, and abuse uh abuse the ideas. So uh, I explained to her, well that's part of what Shade to Sun is about. So I'm particularly inspired now because I, you know, I have people, you know, asking me about such things. And so I know that there's a need for what I'm doing. I just hope that I can do it well enough uh, that it helps fill that need. Okay, now let's get to this thing called the Law of Attraction. You, you heard me talk about it in the very first episode and about it doesn't always work. And I said that we need to remodel it because the idea is if we remodel something, then we'll have a better idea of how how it works. And this is this is the thing. Uh, I want to make it very clear. Uh, there's a saying that a map is not the territory. So a model is a way, you know, a, a deconstructionist, rationalist model uh, is a way of looking at something. It by no means tells you exactly what it is. And there's a really wonderful movie called uh, um, Mind Walk. And in it, this woman is talking about Descartes and how Descartes saw the universe like a clock. And at some point when she's explaining how that model breaks down, uh, they said, so Descartes was wrong. And she says, well, no, he was right in a certain respect. She says, I don't dislike Descartes. It's just that the scientists mistook the model for the universe. So as we deconstruct the law of attraction here and create this model, uh, I want to make it very clear that this is a way of looking at it. It is not the end-all and be-all. But I think I've come up with something that uh, has not been done before. I've seen a lot of other people try to explain the law of attraction. And at some point, well, it's like that cartoon where they, the scientist has a bunch of equations here and a bunch of equations here. And in the middle, he said, it, the, the words are written, and here a miracle occurs. You know? And the guy standing there says, I think you need to work on this part a little more. And, and that's what all these other models that I've looked at, you know, they talk about strings vibrating, and that if you, you, you hit a key on a piano and there's another piano in a room, that note, the string will start to vibrate because they're on the same frequency. And, well, you know, do you vibrate? You know, how do you, how do you vibrate to a frequency? You know, there's a lot of terminology that gets used. Uh, and I'm going to break that down. I want to I wanna get past all the hokey words that make it sound like somebody knows what they're talking about when they, they clearly uh, are they, they're making an argument to convince you not to educate you. Uh, another thing I want to make sure that uh, there's a really good explanation in The Luck Factor uh, by Brian Tracy and his model for the Law of Attraction he talks about how somebody thinks about something, he puts up little pictures of it. Um, you know, the guy wants a vacation to Hawaii, so he puts something up in his cubicle at work. And then a colleague asks him about it, and then he says, I would really like to go to Hawaii. And then he says, well, I heard something on the radio. Long story short, the guy ends up getting vacation time and uh, a, a, a cheaper flight. And it's all a pragmatic process. Because one thing leads to another, and it's more about psychology. What I'm talking about here in this model, and although it's a great model and I respect it a lot, uh, there is also that instance when you think about something, you think about someone you haven't thought about for a while, and they call you on the phone, and then there's you know the classic, how do you you know like in the secret, how can you concentrate on something and have it come into your life? Why does it work sometimes and not others? That's what we're going to look at now first. And again, 
my drawing is uh, not the best, but I just want to express some ideas. These are sort of more, just look at this as thumbnail concepts. So here we have a, a person. We'll make a little stick man. He's got a head. And if you look inside of his head, you would see what I am very poorly drawing as a brain. Okay? Uh, it's a brain, use it or lose it. I'm not sure how well this is appearing on the video, but I'll try to draw things in such a way that they can be seen. All right. So, everybody has a brain. And if you were to look close enough inside of that brain to know how it works, how thoughts are produced, what you'd see are cells they are kind of long, and they have these little feelers coming out. And like I get, and, and please, if you um, are a biologist, understand that I am making this simple. I, could, I, I am educated enough to know there's a lot more detail. Uh, but what happens is all of these little nerves that have all these little uh, feelers that go out, uh, have synapses between them, and what happens is they make chemical connections, and that is how a thought uh, travels through the brain, because we've got different nerve cells, and we get enough of these, what ends up happening is you get patterns, and these patterns make thoughts. Uh, now, I know that there's, I've oversimplified it, and anybody who's very, very into the consciousness argument knows that there's a theory about microtubules that play into uh, the de de uh, determinancy principle. I mention that because I want to say that I'm aware of it, and maybe for later topics it'll be important. But for what I'm explaining right now about the synapses in the nerve cells and how they fire and different ways to create different patterns is enough. We don't need to go to that scale of the microtubules. And, and why do I say this? Okay, where there was an experiment done where they literally uh, took a cat, and I know those of you who are against the animal cruelty, you know, I, I'm not going to post the video for that reason. Uh, but what they did was they, they took a cat and they put a computer chip in its brain, just put a little chip in its brain, and they ran wires out of it, and it was able to record patterns of, of electricity and these uh, firings of these neurons in its optical cortex. And they were able to take that information and decode it and put it on a video screen. And when they did, what happened was they... Uh, they were able to literally see on the screen what the cat was looking at. So they, you know, had a, a, a video in front of the cat. They were showing the cat a movie. The cat was looking at it. And then they had the screen that was operated from the cat's brain. And you could see what the cat saw. So the point that I'm making is it's very clear from that experiment that just that the patterns of these neurons, we can literally pull information from these patterns and show a result, show a thought, show an image. So uh, this idea, and, and once again to be complete, I, there's, there's field theories and I've heard field theories involved with uh, law of attraction. Uh, I want to state that they exist, I want to state that my explanation can deal with them, uh, but we're you know, that's one of those those ideas where you say a miracle occurs. You don't really understand enough about the, the field theory concept of um, uh, that Rupert Sheldrake it talks about. You know, he'll even admit that it's very, very experimental. It's very much an experimental idea. I just want to mention it that, that I have thought about it and I, I can include it. I don't want to get too complicated though. Okay, so now I think that we understand that these thoughts that are in our brain are produced by the patterns of these connections and the firings of the synapses in the neurons. Now, 
what I'm going to draw here is a square. And here I'm going to draw something that looks kind of like a sun. I'm not sure how well this is coming up on the uh, video. But here I'm going to draw something. I'm going to draw what I hope will look like a, a beach ball. Well, my artwork isn't really good, but I think that we get the get the idea how beach ball has little stripes on it. Okay? Now, here's the thing. If you look at your brain and how these brain how these neurons fire, what pattern would represent a square would be very different than the pattern that represents the sun. Because they are very different. But would this pattern that represents the sun be anything like pattern that represents a beach ball. Well, yes, it would, because what happens is uh, you have these synaptic firings and things that are similar, the theory goes, uh, fire similar patterns. So I'm not saying that these two things are identical in the brain, but I'm saying that some of there may be some crossover in some of the neurology because they're both round. Now, keeping this in mind, if we have a softball, okay, and a baseball, which is pretty much very similar to a softball, but the exception is one is smaller. And it's a lot harder. Which is why this is called a softball, and this is called a hard, a, a, a baseball. Or, and the idea being that these two things would be very similar, because even those, you know, if you if you look at these four objects, only three of them are balls. And if you look at these, just these three, these two can be played on a field that is called a diamond. They're hit with a bat. The beach ball typically doesn't have those characteristics, okay? So what the idea being, the way the synapses in the brain are going to fire is going to be much more alike for a baseball and for a softball than they're going to be like for any of these things. Because your brain organizes information. It's what it does. So... We have these patterns, uh, they, they form in the brain, there are similarities between them. Now, what I want to explain is in programming, what a lot of programmers do, and, and this is just basic uh, you know, data organization, that type of thing. You look at something like the sun here, okay, let's just say here's a, the sun, and what we could do here it doesn't matter if you can read this or not. I'm not even going to spell a lot here, but here's the sun, and what we have is we know that it's hot. We know that it's round. Okay? These are what you could call attributes, but what a programmer would call properties of an object. Okay? So if you look at something like, um, you know, the softball, I'm just going to put S, B, Save space. It's going to have properties, and I'm just going to. And then here is just the baseball. Once again, these properties. This is going to be smaller, but small. This is going to be, you know, larger than a baseball, but not as large as a beach ball. So we'll just say it's medium in size. They're. They can both be hit with a bat. They can both uh, be played on a diamond. Like I say, I'm not going to write all that in. But the way the data in your brain is organized, now we're talking not just the organic idea, but the idea that the information that represents a sun is very, di you know, the the properties are very dissimilar, but the properties that represent the baseball in the softball 
are much similar. They have identical properties. So if you were to organize data, whether it be in a brain or in a computer, okay? A little keyboard here. Uh, there's more similarity, so the organizational structure is going to place them closer together. And when I say place, I mean relationally. The relationships are going to be tighter between objects that are similar. You've heard it said in the Law of Attraction, like attracts like. This is the literal breakdown of why that is. Because in informational structures, things are co coordinated by their relationship. And if, their relation, if they have similar properties, they have more relationships. So if this is you, this is the little guy down here, okay, let's just, let's just uh, say Y-O-U, you have a set of properties. You can be big or tall or, or whatever, and your thoughts are also your properties. If you're a really smart person, if you're not so bright, if you have a good memory, uh, what your, your personal uh, things are, and your thoughts come into this. So if you think a lot about something, let's say you think a lot about uh, baseball, <laughs> okay, then that would be a property of your mind. If you think a lot about something, let's say you just, you, you never thought of, I don't know, um, Let's just say you just all of a sudden saw a, a burst, set of birthstone earrings. And a woman finds, sees them, and then all of a sudden she wants them. So she starts thinking about them, okay? So this is good with earring. Then what's going to happen is that becomes a property. And some of you all might see where I'm going with this already. But so far, all we've talked about is the human mind. Okay? And data structures and how they coordinate. So if you think you know where I'm going with this, just, just keep your pants on because we'll get there. Don't worry. Now, let's see. See, I brought notes this time because last time I, you know, got a little bit lost here and there. Now, I, I want to make one more interesting observation I was watching um, a clip from a show. Um, I like to sit on YouTube and waste a lot of time just watching things that I find interesting. And it was one of these game shows about being smarter than a fifth grader. And this woman had a question for a million dollars. And the question was, what was the name of the American pilot to fly faster than the speed of sound? Well, it was really interesting because what this woman started doing was she... First she said, well, oh, she knew she could knew it, she just couldn't remember it. So she said, well, I know that um, Amelia Earhart was the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. I know that uh, Charles Lindbergh was um, the first man to fly across the Atlantic. And she keeps thinking, and she's thinking, I know that Neil Armstrong, let's put, um, Neil over here. Armstrong was the first man to, uh, to to walk on the moon, and she keeps going on like that, trying to come up with the answer. Well, why was she doing this? Why was she just going over wrong answers? You know, well, it's because the way information again is organized. This is a hierarchical representation of what is very, very uh, crazily uh, structured in the brain. So, and we want to hear, and so she, and she even mentioned the Wright brothers. Nah, just, just, okay. So the idea is this information is linked up in a hierarchical structure. And what she was doing is she was hoping that by forcing all these different patterns in her brain that she would eventually remember 
the person she was trying to think of. And so she would follow this pathway, and then she'd follow this pathway, and these are all organized different because one guy went to the moon, the other, you know, they're male and female. There's all these different properties that show how these relationships can be organized. Now, she never did think of it, unfortunately, and she didn't win the million dollars. But I found this very interesting because as I was watching her do this, I thought, oh, now there's a smart woman. She understands enough about how the brain works that she knows that she could hit on it by listing all the other pilots. But you can also become so fixated on one thing that you never get to it, and that's what happened with her. And once again, this will play into why the law of attraction sometimes works and sometimes does not. Uh, the interesting thing was, I found out at the end of the show, uh, she was a, um, it was just a clip from the show. Uh, I wouldn't watch an entire thing like that. But I found this fascinating because at the end of it, she had to say, um, when, they, when they forced these poor people to say how stupid they are, she said, my name is so-and-so, and I may be a graduate with a degree in neurology, but I am not smarter than a fifth grader. And, or she was studying for it. I'm not sure, but she, she had her degree or was studying for it. But then it really, you know, I really kind of felt proud of myself for recognizing this because, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, validated now because the woman who was doing this understood the neurology well enough to do this. So there's, this is pretty much how the information works in your brain, how it's organized, how, and, and why when you think on certain terms, things work a certain way. Okay, now we're going to move to a different topic now. Okay, so this is this is all very important, but let's just file this into its own little grouping here. We're going to structure our information here. And I've got to go someplace else in the universe because I will come back to this, but what we need to do now is say, well, okay, so we know how thoughts in the brain are organized, and we know how they relate, and we know how information systems work as far as the relationships with data and the attributes or the properties, but how do we get out of the brain and into the universe, okay? Well, let's start with something, and, and I've even seen people explain a lot of attraction with this, but they, this is where I think a lot of them uh, fall flat. Uh, there was an ex there's an experiment done where you take a beam of particles and you split the beam into two different beams. Now, uh, I got a very bad grade in a biochemistry um, class in college because what I'm a try what I'm attempting to explain here. I could not understand at the time. There is a property of particles called spin. There is an equation that you can use that determines their spin, and I was not smart enough just to memorize the equation and work the thing. I had the problem because I couldn't imagine how it spun. I was trying to visualize it. Okay, so the point that I want to make, not that I'm a terrible student, uh, but this element of spin is not an actual physical spinning of the particle. It is a property that when it's bombarded with some other particle, what direction um, they fly off. It has nothing to do with anything that actually spins. It's just uh, what physicists chose to call this property. Once again, we're back to objects that have properties. And one of the properties that particles have is a spin. It's not like they're actually physically spinning. It's just a, what they call a property that they have. Now, what they do is they run the beam through a uh, what's uh, what's the proper term for this? It's um, uh, they polarize the beam so that all the so all the particles coming through it that have the spin they want pass through, and the ones that don't go out. They go off of it. So, 
we have a beam that has particles that have the exact same spin and then it is split so that each of these particles have the same spin in each of these beams. And when you affect one beam here by changing its spins, you can, I think it's done by fields, I'm not sure exactly, um, I'll have to review this, but I, I think it's, it's, it's either you pass it through some kind of magnetic field or there's some, some type of physical change that you alter the beam here. And over here, without there being an apparatus, this beam alters too, as if by magic. I'm just going to put an arrow here, from here, because there's no apparatus here, but the beam, and just to show, just to represent it, let's just use a different color here. Let's just say, at this point, See, I'm getting fancy now. I'm using different colors and everything. I'm not sure if it comes up on the screen. All right, so the fascinating thing about this was that no matter how far apart these beams are, not only does it still change, it changes instantly. There's no amount of time from when this gets changed to when this changes. And this is what bothered Einstein, because it's what Einstein called interaction at a spooky distance. And he didn't like it because <coughs> what it does is it changes, it, it, you know, his, his point of view was that nothing could travel faster than the speed of light. I know there's some information right now that's challenging that. I haven't looked into it. Um, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but let's just say that neutrinos are weird particles, and who knows exactly if they're matter that's also been an argument I've heard, but I don't want to get caught up into that tangent. The idea is these particles change instantly, and they've gone miles apart, or kilometers apart for my British friends, um, and it's pretty much understood that if they were, you know, a galaxy apart, they would still change instantly. Now, I, I think his name is David Bohm. He was a physicist who said, well, you know, well, first of all, Einstein's solution to this was that there was a unified field. Once again, fields come back into this, and this is why I say we can, if we want to go with the field theory that being is somehow um, part of this, and, and you know, even if you, if, you know, well, I don't want to hung up on the consciousness arguments, if, you know, but um, if you believe that your soul enters into the brain, or that, you know, let's say you don't believe in a soul, but you have to understand then that uh, personality and your, your consciousness is an emergent property of all this. You know, and then once again, Sheldrake has some ideas about field effects. So, you know, this is where the field effect comes in. That Einstein said that there's a field that allows for this and that transmits the information, okay? But David Bohm said, well, you know, there's another way we can look at it too. And what he said was, we think we're in a three-dimensional universe. What if we were in a two-dimensional universe? Then this beam has no distance between it. And you say, well, I know I'm in a three-dimensional universe because I can throw a baseball, you know, across the field. And I see a depth perception. Well, his idea, once again, is, well, information exists that makes up for that. And this is where we get the concept of a holographic universe. So, you know, is, is, do we have the, we'll just, I am such a bad writer. So here's the universe. And the question is, is it holographic? Okay. Well, this is uh, <laughs> this is the thing that all these other guys talk about the holographic universe and how the universe is a hologram, and they all want to work that into their uh, law of attraction theory. Okay, I don't, but I have to mention it because I want to explain. 
the concept of the holographic universe, as far as I understand it, and how it applies to the law of attraction. Because you see, a lot of these people say, well, if it's a hologram, then, you know, they think it's like Star Trek. You know, you can just program the computer to create whatever you want. Um, and these guys just roll off this idea of a holographic universe just like it just solves all their problems. And they don't really go into the mechanics of what a holographic universe is. Well, my understanding of holographic universe theory is that there are three primary types of holographic universes. One is this, that your mind constructs a universe from its experience in the world. So the holographic universe is a psychological one. That's, that's, let's just, I didn't plan on listing these, but let's just say, you know, you know, one, that it's, um, that it's in your head, okay? Now, there's another idea, too, is David Bohm's concept, that we have a structure in which information lies upon. So it could be a two-dimensional universe with information representing a third. So that it's, that it's uh, information-based. Let's just say info, um, and let's say Bohm's idea. And there's also a third understanding that I have. There was an argument um, concerning black holes as to whether information is lost once, uh, once something is sucked into a black hole. And there was an intellectual argument about it, and I don't thoroughly think you can experiment on something like that, as far as I know, but the, they, they apparently worked enough math on it, and the conclusion was no, as something enters a black hole, even if it's destroyed by the black hole, on the surface of the black hole, the information is stored. And then that led to some conjecture about the idea of a holographic universe. Let's just say this one's a black hole idea, black hole concept. And once again, I'm just, you know, I'm sure people who know more about physics can, you know, can explain these things better. I have, I'm a layman. I have a layman's understanding of these things. So I'm just kind of piecing it together as best as I can. But from what I've looked at, these are the, <coughs> the, the primary three ways that a uh, holographic universe is, uh, is imagined to exist. And the black hole one I find intriguing because uh, the idea is that the universe then has another universe within it, and the information is on the outside. And then they, they say, well, we can take that back, and maybe our universe is a similar structure and the information exists on its surface and we are the result of that. Which again would explain the interaction at a spooky distance because the information get travels. Well, what I want to do with all these holographic, and, and like I say, everyone who throws this into their theory on law of attraction, they never explain which you know, which one of these they're talking about, number one, or, you know, I have not seen one explain it, and number two, they just throw it out there and say, this explains that. So not only do they tell you not which one, but they don't even explain how it, you know, well, here's, here's how I'm going to use the holographic universe idea uh, to, to show how law of attraction works. I say don't take any of these ideas. We don't need them. It doesn't matter. Uh, if, if the holographic universe is in your head, if it's uh, uh, an overlay of a two-dimensional universe, uh, or it's um, a black hole. And, and just to go back to this two-dimensional thing, if, you, if you're still hung up on how can you get, generate a three-dimensional universe and a two-dimensional, from a two-dimensional form, yeah, think about um, a, a 3D video game. It's on a flat two-dimensional chip, but because the information is passing over it, if you were in that virtual world, it would look three-dimensional to you. But I don't care if it's any of these or none of them. The one common thing that underlies all of these is Einstein said information 
has to be transmitted. Bohm said the information may be two-dimensional, an informational overlay on a two-dimensional universe. Um, if it's inside your head, we've already explained how information is structured in your head, but that still doesn't address the fact that there is a universe external from you. And the whole black, the black hole model, once again, addresses information. It's starting to look like, and if I understand this, and please, this is the one thing. There's something that Terence McKenna calls a hard swallow. He says every model, every idea, at some point there is a hard swallow. That means you've got to... You know, you, you, you know it's, it might be difficult to get this down, but they all are basically explanations for how information in the universe is handled. And I'm starting to uh, un understand that I don't think that they're talking about information as how we view and record it. I, I, my understanding is that information is a real thing. It's, an, uh, it's, a, it's as if there's a dimension somewhere where the information must exist either before or simultaneously of events. That means that regardless of which of these holographic universe theories you wish to uh, assume, they're all about information. And it's interesting because I, uh, I watched the special on the Matrix um, and how the philosophy, what philosophies are represented in that, and they went, oh God, you know, from the you know ancient Greece all the way to nearly every philosophy is somehow represented in that. And I was getting a little nervous because I wanted to check my model here against you know some of these ideas and people use the Matrix as a as a hologram type idea a lot too about law of attraction. But um, it was really interesting because toward the end of it, they said everything is information. And I saw that I thought, yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, and so I would really like someone who has a lot more expertise on physics to explain to me, because I, I tried to look into this idea and I couldn't find a lot on it. Uh, but it just seems to me that there is an informational layer to the universe that is either... It's either controlled by or runs simultaneous to it. Now, because it's information, information needs to be organized, right? So it's going to, let me see, how did I represent this here? So there's going to be, you know, some type of data structure, whether it's similar to our brains, uh, whether, you know, like we have neurons, whether it's a, a computer, that's, you know, the matrix idea, we could be living in a computer, uh, or whether it's just some sort of organic universe model um, that, you know, maybe, you know, we, we haven't represented yet, but it's obvious that there's information being uh, stored in the universe, there's information being maintained, things, you know, physicists talk in terms of information being uh, changed and transmitted and, and, and whatnot. Information moves from this being to this being instantaneously. And because it moves instantaneously, um, my, my guess is that uh, it's not that these, the universe works simultaneously with the information. I really believe that the information could come first. And it's what generates events in the universe. So, whatever this, you know, and, and we know that it organizes because you look in the universe and there's structure, there's organization. So it's, you know, so whether you, you buy how I arrived at it through uh, a layman's understanding of physics, or you just look around and see the universe seems to be organized, you know, it's not just energy floating around, uh, it's, it's coalesced and organized into various structures and there's even a, a scope, an ascension of, uh, of complexity, that there must be some type of informational structure here, okay? 
So, here's you, and let's just draw a bunch of other people here. These are all people in your life, people you know. And then there's people you don't know, more people in the world. And let's just say there's a bunch of, uh, of people. And then there's information that is in the universe, like over here. So let's just, let's just make this really thick, dark cloud. Because that is so much information that is represented in the entire universe. So this is a, sort of a, um, a hierarchy. Our hierarchy is probably not a be, uh, the best word, but let's just say this is sort of a scale of uh, how you go from the individual to your community to, you know, humanity to all the information that exists. You see, you are part of this informational structure of the universe. Okay? So you don't have to worry about fields or, or whatever, um, you know, that, that could play into this. You don't have to worry necessarily about how does your brain transmit it, you know. Is it, a, is it like there's psychic waves that are going out? Is it an aura, you know. Uh, although those things are possible, specifically, you are a unit in this massively complex database of information that is the universe. So when you change your attributes, when you change your your um, uh, properties, the universe is it's organizing itself. So it's, oh, this person um, all of a sudden is very, very fixated <coughs> on a pair of earrings. Remember the, the woman I said who had earrings and that becomes an attribute? She wants these earrings. She thinks about them. They become an attribute or uh, a component or a um, property of who she is now. So the universe is going to restructure itself in such a way that that relationship to who this person is and what earrings are available in her, in her vicinity are going to connect. As you change your properties, the universe, because it is an information processing thing, has to restructure in accordance with what you're thinking. Now, let's keep in mind, sometimes you're trying to think of what you want and you're fixated on what is. This is something that um, Abraham, Hick, Abraham Hicks talks a lot about, that you're so focused on what is, you can't get your, your, your mind fo focused on what you want well enough. Uh, and there's also the possibility that maybe the universe does this too. You have to, to realize that this model that is informational is... Uh, basically saying the universe structures information, you change the way you think, it becomes uh, part of your, your makeup, it's got to adjust, it might not want to adjust the way you want it to. So, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Um, well, you know, I think we'll save that for later. I, I, I think for right now, I wanted to just get a model for how, and I don't want to go in too deep about how this works and how it doesn't work, but I did want to give a model that is totally physics-based that explain how you have a thought, it becomes part of your new list of properties, and the amount of energy you put on that will cause the universe to restructure the data because it's constantly updating the data and updating the relationships. It's also how people come into your life. It's all, you know, this is why when you think of somebody and then you know, the phone rings and it's them, particularly if it's someone you haven't talked to for a long time, uh, it's because these, this information is getting updated. 
And then it's like, well, which came first? You know, did you, did, did the universe put that thought into your head? Because this works two ways. And that's, so the person was calling, they were thinking about you, and then the universe said, well, since, you know, this person, you know, since, since you know, this person is calling this person, that is immediately going to, you know, instantaneously, just like the, the change in the, in the particle beam, that is going to instantaneously connect with you. Now, another thing that Sheldrake's work, Rupert Sheldrake's work, has shown is that the people who are closely, who are more closely associated with you, this phenomenon is more likely. Um, so, what I want to do is I want to point, put an arrow here to the mass of humanity as well as your friends, and I want to write a word here. Hopefully, I'll write it big enough that it'll be seen. Young. Carl Gustav Jung had an idea of the collective unconscious. And I believe that this area here is what he was talking about, and to a similar degree, this as well. So I think that the, we've, we've covered this enough. I repeated myself a lot because I wanted to make sure I, I, I said it in a way that it was understandable. I um, I, I want to leave this on the board. I want to look at it again. I want to talk about other phenomenon. I want to talk about why this does and doesn't work. Um, I, and, I, and I want to also express, you know, thank you for hanging with me this long, because I'm not sure what the time frame on this. I didn't put a clock on it. I just hope that the record, we're still recording okay on the video. But um, I just wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, that this model comes across in a way that there are no gaps. That it was based on the laws of physics as we understand them, and, and granted I have a layman's understanding. I wanted to make sure that I didn't go too deep into the information, although I could have gone somewhat deeper, but not too too deeper. Uh, but I, I hope this suffices. If anybody sees a gap, let me know. I... Um, It, it, it seems to to come full circle. So thank you again. Um, in the future, uh, like I said, we we will address this diagram one more time, uh, and then it'll be easier. It'll be simpler. I just wanted to put this out as uh, something that we can reference in the future. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody has explained the, the law of attraction this way. Uh, they've come close, and they've used parts of this, but they've always had a gap. I really, really hope I'm onto something here. I really ho hope that, this is, that, that with this model we can move forward into understanding the law of attraction, as well as a lot of other psychic phenomenon. And with this model, uh, better train ourselves uh, to in how to use the law of attraction and understanding that there's a really big universe out here and that there are uh, there are a lot of not only other individuals but there are a lot of other forces at work that affect your properties and we're going to address that in the future and this to me is a model that not only explains how the law of attraction works, but also why it doesn't always work, and what you can do, we'll explore what we can do to make it work more often for us. Uh, so, like I say, um, I'm also, uh, I, I do uh, tarot readings, I'm thinking this month of having a half price sale. Uh, go to the web page, you can see I'm also thinking about coming up with a 2000, with a special 2012 spread. Uh, 
So uh, check out the website. Uh, if, you, if you're impressed enough, by all means, um, you know, go ahead and buy, you know, buy, buy a tarot read. Also, if you believe enough in what I'm doing and want to see me move forward with this kind of thing, uh, you can donate just you know freely. There's a uh, on the web page. There's a button you can click. And although yeah, I am I do need to pay bills. That's for sure. Also, I'm hoping that you know if I were ever to have enough in donations and in uh, sales of uh, tarot readings, uh, I would improve my equipment. <laughs> you know, this is a webcam um, stuck up on a tripod, a professional tripod, but still it's a webcam and scotch tape to it and. I'm doing a lot of stuff here that's you know could be improved on, could be done better, and uh, so by all means, if you feel this is, is is worth something to you, donate if you'd like a, a reading. Uh, go ahead, uh, click on the link that's in the web that's in the uh, that will place in the uh, description section of YouTube, and go to the website and uh, see what's there. Thanks a lot for sticking with me. Peace.